everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Enterprise MT Tailored to the Organization's Specific Needs. My name is Kate Bradshaw and I will be your host. Your SDL speakers today are Kirti Vashi, Language Technology Evangelist, and Quinn Lam, Senior Program Manager, Product Management SDL. We expect today's webinar will last about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. I will now pass her over to Kitty to begin the presentation. Good morning. Um, we live in a time of great change, and this is one of the reasons why machine translation has become so important. There is a content explosion that is increasingly global now. We see that social media is a critical business driver and that as many as 600 billion words a day are being translated by generic empty portals. And um, also we see that customers now increasingly purchase globally. If you look at the global organization, you'll see that there's lots more communication happening between different parts of the world, different parts of the company within the world. and. It is now commonplace to be talking to people in China and Europe and the U.S. on a regular and daily basis. And social media is increasingly being monitored as a source of information for marketing and improving customer satisfaction. Also, increasingly we see that global teams are involved in sharing design information and collaborating much more in, on a daily and very regular basis. And it has been very clear that customer support and service capabilities need to be global and multilingual increasingly, or companies will receive very unsatisfied customer responses, and these customers have the power today to make themselves very vocal and very public, um, and not to mention the confidential information that is often needed. So, so basically, we see that large volumes of multilingual data need to be translated on a pretty instant basis, and there is great value in having this information and this translatability available to, to the global enterprise. And it is increasingly understood that taking translation capabilities beyond localization, taking it into communication and collaboration, and to much more interactive and active communication with the customer is a critical requirement for success. So we see, you know, if we take a look again at that huge use of machine translation on a daily basis, we see that 600 billion words a day, it, and only really 1% or even less is, is focused on localization. So there's a huge amount of Enterprise use of machine translation in an uncontrolled way. You know, it's estimated to be as much as 10%, but at least 5% of this 600 billion words a day is uh, 600 billion words a day is being uh, is being uh, 30 to 60 billion words a day are being. Uh, are being used by enterprise users in an uncontrolled way. Now, there is clearly a problem when enterprise employees are cutting and pasting critical business content, private corporate content, you know, communications and emails, new product designs in generic public portals. And firstly, the generic portals often do not understand the specific terminology of this content. They are very clear data security and leakage of confidential enterprise information. And also the fact that you have to do this cut and paste stuff makes it very inefficient and affects the, the efficiency of the overall process. And it, both Google and Microsoft make it very clear that when uh, used are doing this cut and paste in their translation portals. They have the right to use this information, to analyze it, to reuse it, to store it. And there is always a security um, 
risk when this is being done. It is estimated that in just the first three months of the year, there have been over a thousand data leakages, you know, data leakage uh, re reports filed you know, with across the enterprises. So let's take a quick look at what the issues are with of gener generic public empty system versus enterprise adapted empty system. The first basic thing is that public systems tend to be a one-size-fits-all. There really is no ability to tune it to your specific needs. And and so it is what it is, and if it's of value, then it can, it can still be a useful because the need for translation is so great. But enterprise empty systems are optimized for the specific customer subject matter. So it will understand product names. It will understand very specific terminologies. If you're a car company, it will understand automotive terms. If you're a consumer electronics company, it will understand very specific consumer electronic terms that are important in your communications with you, with, within your, the organization and with your customers to ensure you know, that the communications are effective. And also, most importantly, it is secure and private. You know, enterprise empty systems allow you to translate both the external content that is on your web anyway, and you know, that is all public content, but also allows you to to share private communications between you and your customers, and between global employees to deal with customer issues uh, and. And to deal with customer information and, and um, so essentially we have reached a point in time that most global enterprises understand that translation needs to go beyond localization and you know there is a much broader enterprise awareness of where empty can be used to add value. So, you know, here's a listing of just a few of the areas that we have seen, that we at SDL have seen, where our customers are using MT. So all the way from human resource communications in large global companies, corporate governance and e-commerce applications, just sharing private uh, collaboration content, you know, from enterprise um, content management systems. Customer experience monitoring is a huge growth area where the value of doing this is so significant and so impactful to the enterprise's future that more and more people are beginning to understand that we need to be monitoring the global customer, understand what they're saying and why they're saying. So in general, you know, we're seeing the the growth of this capability, the instant translation need increasing all the time. Now, it's important to understand that when you tune an empty system for your specific need, it needs to be matched to the business. Now while there is an awareness that we want to get the best um, empty output quality possible, it, that issue is much higher and much more important um, in the localization context or in when you're translating large amounts of marketing content or legal content where the process might involve um, machine translation plus post editing plus you know some additional review and it's a very very uh, human engaged process but you also tend to see that the volumes tend to be low there you know and Generally, we see that wherever the highest quality requirements, where you want almost human translation, the volumes tend to be lower. But more and more, when you're monitoring things like customer experience, or when you're just trying to facilitate corporate communications and collaboration content, the needs for the machine translation quality need to be enough to enable the communication to happen, to be able to understand what the customer experience is. and the volumes of information are very high, and you know, by very high, I mean like be millions of words a day, and even hundreds of millions of words a day. And that is 
the place where the machine translation can add the greatest value to the enterprise. It's useful to look at what machine translation is. There is often an impression that all machine translation is the same, but just like there are many different kinds of cars and there are many different kinds of TVs, there are many different kinds of machine translation. Um, in general, the lowest quality machine translation you will see out there will be from people who are doing it themselves using open source toolkits, but don't really have any real expertise. So that they will produce the lowest quality MP. And you know, you will see this often in the translation industry where where this you know, these kinds of systems proliferate. The generic public MP systems that rep represented by you know Google and Bing are the most widely used systems, but they're you know, they're a one size fits all, they're meant for random internet users and they're not um, really human for enterprise use. Um, the to to develop good MT systems requires real expertise. It does not it, there's more to it than just throwing data into uh, some sort of toolkit and processing the data and getting some kind of you know, output there. You need to understand when things don't work, what to do, how to improve the, the specific error patterns you're seeing, et cetera. And re it requires real expertise that can only happen and is built over time. In the modern world today, we see that there's two machine translation paradigms that are particularly prominent in, in the, and, you know, generating a lot of buzz. Neural MT is the rising star and has shown that it's very successful in handling very difficult languages like Korean and Japanese. And adaptive MT is also a very good paradigm and machine translation implementation where the interaction between the user and the and the system becomes much more engaged and much more interactive, and you see a continuous learning process. In fact, both neural MT and adaptive MT are systems that learn on a much more active, much more interactive basis. And we will talk a little bit about that. So when we talk about tailoring MT systems to enterprise needs, there is a range and degree of adaptation that can happen. Um, that have a direct relationship to the MT output quality. So there is much that the customers can manage and do by themselves. You know, this can include just adding critical terminology, um, using much more vertically focused, you know, so focusing your content only on automotive content, for example, only on information technology language so that systems perform at a higher level in that domain than they would on other stuff. Um, so, so there is, a, you know, there's really like three basic levels. There is the customer managed adaptation. Then, if you want higher quality, you may come to experts like SDL, who will train the systems and do much more deep analysis and much more deep um, adaptation of the systems to tune tune them to your specific needs. And for those systems where very high quality is needed, you may also bring in post-editing and linguistic steering capability so that you bring a whole range of things to tune the systems to your specific needs. Of course, as you bring more experts in, there is a cost and there is a time that a time of development required. So there, there's a range of options available and SDL is the only one that has the full breadth that we discuss here that across the board. So what basically happens when you adapt a system for your specific needs is that you see that you will get better quality on your very specific subject, you know, and it's tuned to your very specific needs. So that while generic systems all are about the same, um, and there will be one system that might be better in one specific area, um, the public portals tend to focus on news, but the 
enterprise systems are much more focused on communication, collaboration, and customer service related content. Um, so there are many enterprise entity use cases that can be solved with a minimal amount of adaptation. Um, if you look at the range of options, you see that really there are two key parameters in evaluating empty use cases. One is the volume. You know, there, there are use cases that involve millions or even tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of words a day. And there's lower volume, maybe thousands or tens of thousands at most, uh, where the quality requirements are very high. So you know, localization is an example of where you are trying to get reduce the you know the cost of translating some very specific and very limited set of content, but the broader enterprise need, and where we have evidence that millions of words a day are being translated, is in areas like customer support, in knowledge based communications, in just emails, you know, between a Chinese manufacturing entity with uh, you know, design teams in Europe and the US, um, social media analysis, and just identifying specific kinds of important information that exist in an organization. Um, so w when we embark on a mission to improve an MT system to address the very specific needs of an enterprise, we always start with the data. And the better you understand the source content and the training data that are involved, the better your ability to produce systems that meet your needs. And I'll hand over to Quinn, who will give you a little bit more information on the specific um, deeper ad adaptation issues. Great, thank you, Curtie. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, part of the I'll present part of the things that we do with our um, MT expert when we work with a customer to adapt their uh, the engines to the content that they do. So here we just present to you some some kind of uh, language pair adaptation evaluation we do at the beginning. Uh, so first and foremost, it's all about the data and the content that you're you're interested to translate. So what we do is a source content analysis that include things such as ensuring that the, uh, we understand the structure and the format of the content that you're interested in translating, um, checking for uniformity of the domain and style. Um, if something that you're interested in translating is very narrow or is it very broad, um, and how similar that is to the materials that you have available to build your machine translation engine. Then we do the data asset analysis. So this is more of an analysis of everything that you have available to provide to the machine to learn from. So we do things such as align and check, making sure the data is clean, that you know the, the language are the ones that you believe it is so that there's not um, wrong languages in your data. Uh, check things like word count uh, and similarity of the source content to the data asset that you are, will be providing for creation of the engine. Um, then after we do that, we would go through um, different kinds of evaluation to check the suitability of the adaptation to your desired use case. So we use both, we leverage both human evaluation and automated evaluation. And you can see underneath, those are some of the kind of evaluations that we do. And because we did you know, say that at the very core of any kind of language pair adaptation for your use case. It is really about the data that you have available to create that engine. Um, so these are the type of training data, the data assets that we usually check with the customer uh, to make sure that we have gotten everything that would be relevant. So what we have is the bilingual data. So these are truly the core of the training data. Um, they're content that has been previously translated and they're usually in the form of a translation memory. Then we also check for things such as terminology. Uh, so they could be, you know, term lists or just a list of, you know, terminologies that are prefer, approved, or even the list that your company do not want to use. 
Um, so all those are important aspects. Um, then there's the source content only data. So these are data represent the kind of content that you'll be translating in your use case with machine translation. And the target only content are representative documents in the translated language that you might have already uh, translated before or you created in that native language. And so the, the adaptation process uh, for a language pair really is dependent on the data. And we want to reiterate this with th this particular slide that kind of just showed that one of the key things is that you want to make sure your translation memory, your data asset, really is a good overlap with the source data that you intend to use the machine translation on. And so the best is when the data asset or the translation memory that you have is well aligned with the content that you'll be translating in the future. And this is a high level overview of the um, translation work, uh, I'm sorry, the language pair adaptation workflow that we have behind the scene. Uh, so it's very iterative training. Uh, so when we have the data ready and we kick off the training behind the scene, it is all automated and we go through iterative trainings that produce hundreds to thousands of engines so that we can use our automated metrics uh, to see which one are the best. And so we have, um, you know, to, to our capacity, a very scalable process so that we can kick off and do numerous training to achieve the best engine for the use case that you're interested in doing. And so this is just a few uh, pointers on some of the improper testing issues that could occur in the language pair adaptation. Uh, so one of the most commonly uh, made mistakes when people do it themselves um, or if they're new to doing any language pair adaptation is utilizing uh, the same data that they had introduced to the machine translation to learn from, utilizing some of those same content in the test data that they use. And so this is a really key critical error because it will re result in misleading um, evaluation. You are basically uh, rigging the system in a way for it to translate better for the content that you had already gave it during the training process. Um, and then a few other things that are commonly, um, you know, occurring issues when people are doing their own language pair adaptation is that uh, the sample files that they are testing do not correspond to the true translation flow that they'll be using the machine translation engine in, um, or the sample files do not contain representative uh, content that the project will eventually be uh, translating. And some of the common issue with the data asset or the translation memory is there's just inconsistent terminology, um, excessive tag formatting, sanitation issues, misaligned content, etc. So these are all things that need to be caught early on before the training of the engine happens. Um, and, and so, you know, that's what the MT expert does here. Um, they have scalable process that allow them to parse through the data asset in the volume of millions um, and do, do it quickly and repeatable. So some of the benefits of a structure MT adaptation process. Um, so obviously there's a shared clarity and understanding of the client machine translation roadmaps and the goals uh, with the provider. We tailor to the relevant uh, solution that they're intending to use the MT engines for. And most essentially, it really is a framework to accommodate for future requirements. So it's again, it's not about creating one engine and that becomes a stagnant engine uh, for all future. Um, it really is about setting up a process that's repeatable, is scalable, um, and it's reliable. And so these are the kind of empty quality evolution that happen as you go through different training cycle, as you go through um, deployment, use, and then feedback. Also, the initial system generally to stay there, so you can get incremental improvement in the quality of the engine, utilizing feedback that happen when you actually deploy it in a real production environment. 
Um, and so at SDL, um, while we're providing the MT adaptation services, uh, we're re are backed by an R&D team that continue to be at the forefront of the next generation technology. Um, and we have a framework where any advancement in the research community, we can quickly incorporate it into our framework and uh, utilize it in a production system for our customer uh, in a much, much shorter development cycle. So over back to you, Curdy. Okay. So one of the areas where many people get bogged down when dealing with machine translation is on the question of quality. Um, machine translation is not a complete replacement for human translation, and it is not a completely equivalent capability to human translation. Many people have identified machine translation as one of the toughest problems in artificial intelligence because there are many things about human language that make machine translation a more challenging problem than, than for example, you know, classifying objects and you know, identifying a cat from a cat, you know, cat in a dog picture. So, so when we look at quality, there are really three different ways that you, sh you should be considering it. In the system development process, and only in the system development process, when it is done properly, we use automated evaluation metrics. And the most commonly used one is something called the BLEEP score, B-L-E-U. And it, it basically measures how the MT output is relative to a, a human reference set. So it gives you a clue as to and it should be a blind set. It should, you know, there are proper ways to do it, and you need to know how to do that. Then you can also, another way to assess quality is that if you are assessing whether it works for a customer knowledge-based application, then is the information understandable? Is, a, you know, and you test it with actual customers. That is a better way to assess the quality of the content. And so, in general, when you look at the question of quality, you should focus on the suitability of the purpose. It should, it should rarely ever be focused on linguistic issues or, you know, you've got a comma wrong or you've got the word in the wrong order. You know, the, these issues that often many translators bring up are relatively unimportant when you're dealing with millions and even hundreds of millions of words. So what we see that in real production high-value enterprise use cases, the metrics that matter the most is, is it enhancing global communication and collaboration? Does it facilitate the communication between your Chinese manufacturing plant and your German design and your American marketing team? Does it allow you to quickly understand the customer's experience? In the localization use case, even, the measure of is not, is it perfect translation, it is, does it facilitate productivity or not? And these are very important because if you apply the wrong metric, you know, you are going to spend a lot of time trying to do something that may or may not be possible. So of the two, of the automatic indicators, blue scores and edit distance are the most widely used. Um, but generally, it, it, it is about improving global communication. It is about better monitoring of global customers. And it is about sharing more information globally, regardless of language. Enterprise MT enhances global responsiveness and knowledge sharing. And, and that is kind of a key thing to understand. So there are different kinds of tools. There's tools that are based on human assessments, so scores that human beings give to a sentence. The translators who are competent in both languages can assess, and they're automatic tools. And you need to be able to understand and use both of them in combination because you need both to be able to make meaningful assessments. And again, this is something that SDL has been doing across thousands of engines. You know, I have hundreds of you know large-scale production systems in place. We have deep expertise in doing this kind of thing. Um, there are many enterprise use cases that can be done and that can be solved with minimal amounts of adaptation. And, you know, and much of this can be managed directly by the customer. So, you know, 
you know, it could be as simple as just using vertically focused engines. You know, using an engine that was built, you know, a base engine that was built only with automotive data or only with information technology related content. And so you get a system that is tuned specifically for that and outperform generic systems on that. But the most common things that we see for many large scale MT applications is the ability to adjust your glossary and terminology because those matter to an organization. And that at that level of tailoring is a very critical thing. Also the there are we have the ability for customers to automatically add the translation memory and we we take it through a training process and allow you to train a baseline engine to make it more closely tuned to your specific needs. And we find that for many communication, collaboration, e discovery use cases and social media analysis for monitoring and managing customer experience issues that this light level of uh, adaptation is more than adequate and very effective in being and tailoring the MT system to your specific organization. I'm going to hand it back to uh, to Quinn to talk about some of the exciting new possibilities that are coming with neural machine translation where uh, and let her explain that. Uh, yeah. So with our neural machine translation, we provide our users with an online adaptation via a feature we call dictionary. And what this does is it enables any users, regardless of their MT background, their expertise, to affect the output of the machine translation system. Also, this is a way to enable enterprises to enforce specific corporate terminology on the MT output um, in a dynamic and real-time way. So how does this actually really work? Um, so we have a quick diagram here to really explain it. So it actually allows enterprises to create multiple dictionary on the fly on the same core MT engine. So a one-time change that was done for a particular department uh, does not necessarily need to impact all users. Um, and so this allows enterprises to cater to each department's unique terminology needs. And so the diagram on the right is a little bit small, but for example, at the very center, we have an SEO MT engine. Um, what users can do is create unique dictionary to their needs. Uh, so for example, let's say the dictionary uh, the number one is a dictionary created by the, the, um, the manufacturing team where terminology in it refers to the terminology for components of an automobile. And so we have an example here where a distributor in this particular context actually referring to a, a part on a car engine that um, is it, it, uh, part of the car engine. Whereas in the legal department for dictionary two, a distributor there really means in the sense of a partner who does uh, distribution, uh, that, that does a, that's a distributor uh, in the sales channel in the region. And so with SCLMT, the manufacturing department can have their own dictionary, the legal department can have their own dictionary, and when you get the same source sentence, such as the distributor is working well, where you know it, where it's really exactly that that is the sentence, that if it's going through the components team, it will be translated as the distributor of the car part, um, whereas in the legal department, it will be more of the partner distributor. Um, and so this is where you see this online adaptation that lets users who don't need to know about the machine translation technology at all, just understanding their content and their context so that they can just create these dictionary lists very quickly and on the fly and as many different lists as they need to cater to the different departments that they have in their enterprise. So we'll go, go back, back to you, to, Yeah. So we, we'll go back to looking at w what are the more extensive uh, adaptation capabilities that we have. And when you focus, when you look at that, the kinds of things that happen there are much more involved 
in terms of identifying gaps in the data, in the training data that cause certain error patterns or identifying, you know, error patterns that are problematic in the, in the use case. Um, um, there's many data optimization things, analyzing where the, how the post editing strategy should be done. This is the kinds of things that, that improve the MT over time. So, you know, if, to, to give you a, a big picture view of this again, the, our intent is to tailor the MT system to the enterprise's needs. So there's a range of capabilities that uh, can be managed by the customers directly, and you know, we, are, we provide training and guidance in this. And there are things that need very much deeper expertise. You know, since we're building thousands of MT systems, we have built thousands of MT systems. We have a much deeper understanding of what might work, might not work, and have many powerful tools that help us in the analysis of the data that create these, these empty systems. And so we can take, you know, the empty systems to much higher quality level. Um, so I, I'd like to point out that there are some difference between what we call linguistic steering and post-editing. In local, post-editing is a localization focused um, human feedback mechanism. It's a way that you know, you, you're trying to produce almost human quality or a human quality output, but machine translation is, tends to always fall a little bit short or sometimes a lot short. And the post-editing is the process by which you take it to human quality. But linguistic steering is when you're dealing with millions of words a day or hundreds of millions of words a day, and you need to do things at a corpus and at a patent level, because it is simply not physically possible to post edit 100 million words a day. And it tends to be the activity of steering the engine to provide more competent, more accurate translations around important patents. And this is, the, this is increasingly the kind of linguistic work required on real enterprise cases. So basically, what most linguistic steering steer, it works around is your understanding of the data that is going to be involved. You know, so if you know what you intend to translate, if you have, say, um, a website, um, if you're a travel company and you have 150,000 hotel descriptions, you know, so let's say that's 20 million words, the way to approach that is by analysis of the corpus. And what would you do? You would go and identify high-frequency terms. So what are the most common word, word clusters that are used in describing a hotel? And you could, you know, you could identify the most frequently, frequent terms you know, using natural language processing. You would address things like people, places, na place names, you know, facility names, product names, other things that need to be translated in a very specific way. For example, Times Square could be translated into German or Japanese with the word, you know, because they both have the word times and square, but no, you should really leave it as Times Square because you're, you're talking about a physical location in New York City. And so you build lists of these things, and then maybe there are specific language-specific patterns that you might need to address. So, you know, in Portuguese, there, there's a lot of use of diminutives, and you need to find ways to address that through specific kinds of, um, uh, you know, machine translation controls or handle German compound words. So anyway, an understanding of the source data up front gives you the ability to handle a 20 million word project where you want to make it available in five languages in two months, for example. And this is possible using this kind of a strategy. So, you know, we talked about the source content analysis and the data assets analysis. Um, and, you know, here are some examples where, in some cases, our, our generic engine might actually work, you know, in its, in its, in its uh, basic form, in its baseline form. And some might require minimal, a minimum amount of adaptation around terminology of very specific, important uh, terms. 
and there may be some cases where you might have much deeper uh, analysis done where the source content is also analyzed, you identify the entities, you make specific terminology, then you use translation memory, you clean up the data, and you know, so this is the range of options that you could be involved with when you work with machine translation. Uh, so let's take a look again on where can MT be used in the enterprise. And as we have been pointing to, um, it, the need to communicate and collaborate real time on a global scale has become very critical in a lot of large uh, globally focused companies. And increasingly, the most, the highest value um, application of machine translation is focused around listening to global customers and responding to global customers in a timely manner. And a timely manner means pretty close to instantly. So it could be customer support content. It could be product design and just knowledge sharing within an, within an organization. It could be the social media. What are they saying about this new product? What, what did they think about this? Who are the customers that are complaining about what we're doing? Um, and specifically emails and internal communications around strategy that you really don't want going on to a generic MT portal. Um, it is said now by more and more analysts and experts are on how companies succeed in this digitally transformed world, that content is what drives revenue and is critical to overall customer experience. More and more people are buying products without ever talking to a salesperson. There are estimates that in the range of 60 to 75% of all products bought today, consumer electronics, computers, and you know, groceries, are done by people by looking at content. So you need content to keep your customers, and you need content to get your customers. And so there's millions and hundreds of millions of words involved in creating this content to, to acquire your customers and to keep them. And the ability to handle multilingual content will only make the organization more agile and more capable of responding to these customers. So, um, sorry, that, so this need for secure enterprise communication collaboration, okay, it insists on going to the next slide, so let's move on. And um, information governance is now, you know, things like GDPR, we see that there is more and more need to go through large uh, corporate uh, data repositories and find critical uh, um, patterns. You know, like how how are we communicating to our uh, supply chain? You know, are the communications are we promising things that we shouldn't be promising? You know, so just monitoring the, the kind of, of policies that are being maintained or not. Customer experience, as I've mentioned. Uh, suggested repeatedly is a um, very critical and central issue for any kind of digital transformation nowadays. And increasingly, the need to be able to find and search uh, information and find that needle in the haystack is which, and that haystack is multilingual, is increasingly going to be driven by um, machine translation. So here's an example of machine translation workflow in an e-discovery context, you know, where you may involve OCR and audio transcription, and then, you know, through a massive volume, you know, like where hundreds of millions or even billions of words are involved, you identify the certain language, different languages, and then you machine translate them, and then you use it for a triage function. You use it to find the documents that need human review. So rather than deal with 10,000 documents, you're dealing with 100. This is a problem that machine translation can provide great value in. Machine translation lets you look at very large volumes of unstructured content that could be text, audio, or images, and lets you find what matters, and then lets you get to the most important content. And this is, I think, going to be an increasingly important role for machine translation use in enterprise contexts. So um, STL 
is an empty solutions provider that allows the enterprise to, to you know, and enables the enterprise to have a great deal of control. Control over data security and privacy and confidentiality, control over how, what systems you've integrated with, within your in IT infrastructure so as to facilitate flows of data rapidly, make them rapidly multilingual, and also allows you to control the quality of the MT to tailor it specifically for your very specific terminology and to give you the range of adaptation possibilities if you have the need to have much higher quality. So, you know, as we close this uh, webcast, I, I, I just want to point out some takeaways that you might gather from our presentation. The empty is, is complicated. You know, I will, while I'm saying it can be complex, it is very complex. You know, there are now 10 open source neural machine translation toolkits. Which one do you choose? Some only work in certain CPUs. It's, it's very complex, and so it is important to work with experts. Um, match the empty development strategy to the business purpose. You know, don't look for linguistic perfection. Look for, is it going to enhance the business purpose that I'm focused on? Um, integrate empty into your larger IT infrastructure so that it becomes seamless, so it becomes transparent. It's like electricity. It's like email. It's like you know, just your network, it's everywhere. And map the quality improvement efforts to the purpose. This is where many enterprises get tangled up in the quality, oh, it's not human quality, but, you know, they've they overlooked the high value that machine translation in its, you know, base form can provide. And continue to measure and improve it. You know, when you work with experts, they will teach you how to do this so that your, the quality is always improving. That basically is the presentation we have today, and um, we thank you for your attention and for your presence here today, and we, I, we're happy to answer some questions if there are. Hi, Katie. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Katie and Quinn, for presenting. I think it's been very interesting stuff. Um, and we have had some questions in, so um, I will get started straight away. Um, Please feel free, if you've got any more questions, to send those in now, and we'll get those answered in these next 10 minutes. So um, the first question that's come in is about the volume of data. So what volume of data do we, the customer user, need to provide SCL in order to train an engine properly? Sure. So that's one of the commonly asked questions that we also do get. So as a rule of thumb, we do recommend um, a million words of parallel data. Um, but obviously quantity, especially with neural machine translation, um, the quality of the data actually matters a lot. Um, matters a lot more than the quantity of the data that we saw previously with statistical-based machine translation. Um, and so as a rule of thumb, we do recommend in a million parallel words, uh, but we have been successful in producing uh, well-suited adaptive language pairs for a customer that have less. Um, so it's about the volume of the translation memory that they have, but also how um, uniform or how homogenous the source content that they're translating is as well. So if it's very domain-specific, then generally we do find more success in, uh, tra uh, in training an engine. Great. Thank you, Quinn. Um, perfect. We have another question here as well around NMT. So um, I'll just read the question how it's come in. Um, so NMT adaption takes place after the baseline MT engine has been applied, or does the engine apply the dictionary suggestions before feeding the files to be processed to the NMT? Hello. I think um, Queen could be having a couple of problems with her audio. Um, well, the, um, NMT, can you can help there? Yeah, so NMT adaptation can take place, it has to take place after the baseline MT engine is in, in place. And as Quinn reported, you know, one of the possibilities that NMT offers is the ability to have a 
same engine, but the same core engine, be different things to different departments. So, you know, the legal department has a certain view of it and has a certain terminology preference, and the manufacturing and the marketing people could all have totally different kinds of um, terminology preferences that can all be maintained at the same time. And one of the wonderful things about about neural machine translations is that in addition to providing very good quality right from the get-go, it allows you to interact and modify it in a much more straightforward way and much more flexible way so that we believe that it, it'll become more and more the preferred way. I, I, hopefully that, and it, it's different from the process. You know, in the SMT, you had to train with it. You couldn't just apply terminology, or you could do it as a post process, but the, the neural machine translation um, adaptation is a more flexible and more powerful capability. And uh, there's research we are doing it at, SM, at, at uh, SDL that is focused on making this even more powerful and, and to make it such that it doesn't affect the overall smoothness and fluency of the translations. And, um, you know, the terminology control has been one of the big challenges of the initial translation, but we believe that uh, our team has a much better solution than any, any we've seen in the market. Great, thank you very much, Katie. Um, okay, next question is, how are you enhancing and customizing NMT? Is it working better or worse than what you did with SMT? How different is your process from your SMT improvement process? Thank you. I'll take this one. Um, so it's a, it's a very, uh, there's, there's a lot in this particular question. So I'll just try to maybe just scratch the surface in um, answering it a little bit. Um, so at SDL, we do have an R&D division um, that actively do research and c contribute to advancement of machine translation in the field. Um, and so in terms of how are we enhancing NeuroMT, um, our, our R&D team continue to look into uh, different approaches, uh, investigating algorithm, and picking particular areas where they can um, improve the machine translation output that actually can uh, tie back to the production system or how our customer use it in a production environment. So case in point would be what we were sharing earlier with the NeuroMT online adaptation using dictionaries. Um, so that was a, a breakthrough that we recently did. We published a paper and we share with the community. Um, so it is very spot um, uh, improvements that we're providing on the research front. And in terms of um, you know how do we bridge that to more of a production environment to what our customers is using, again, it's about owning the code base and the framework that allow us to quickly incorporate development um, and advancement in the research team uh, into the product itself. Um, and so that's just part of, you know, our um, general R&D here at SEL for MT. And the next question is, is it working better or worse than what we did for SMT? Um, you know, I, you know our, our model is continuous improvement, uh, continue to push the boundary for MT quality. Uh, so just with that, you know, the next generation and moving forward is NeuroMT. So definitely uh, everything we're seeing with neural machine translation has shown very, very promising results for the quality advancement that we can expect from the technology to come into the future. Um, and so I definitely think it is better. Um, there's obviously some drawback now that we're moving to neural machine translation, uh, such as maybe translation speed now is um, something that's back on the table for us to address and, um, and, and see how we can bring it to the same level of speed that the statistical model previously um, enjoyed. And so how different is our process from SMT improvement process? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make an assumption that that part of the question is more on the customer adaptation. How do we adapt our language pair to the customer um, 
content. And so the process is very similar. Uh, with the, maybe we focus significantly more on that data preparation now because, as I mentioned earlier, with neural machine translation, the quality of the data that get um, get that get used to train the engine uh, is even more important. So neural NT engine is more sensitive to the quality of the system, um, and it doesn't require as much data as the typical engine used to. Um, and so now we're putting more effort in making sure the quality of the data is good. And so that's that's one difference in our uh, process for over the SMT improvement process. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Uh, we can definitely go into more details for any of these um, as a follow-up. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, think I agree, Quinn. And if anyone does want to follow up um, directly with us, please do get in touch, um, you know, to explore that in more detail. So, no, perfect. Thank you for the answer. I think we've got time for just one more question before we close today, um, which is, what are the highest ROI areas for enterprise MT deployment? Um, as we look across the, the customer base of our hundreds of MT customers, we see that the, the highest volume users of MT are people focused on two applications. One is on understanding what customers are saying about products. So we have people so in the travel industry that are participating in hotel reviews, for example. And it gives very critical information to the hotel um, chains on how they need to change their communication and what they need to improve in the system hotel. So it's, it's, it's very high value there and you know, it's considered uh, it, because it, 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 there's a direct association between the use of the MT and understanding of advertising strategy and understanding of how it affects total revenue. Um, another application we've seen with several of our IT industry customers is in internal communication and collaboration. Increasingly, we see that global um, information technology and consumer electronics firms are spread across the world. You know, and where you have like a very common model is that you have manufacturing being done in China, you have some design and market research being done in Europe, and some design marketing market research being done in the U.S. And all these teams need to communicate on a daily basis. They need to share information as they're designing products. They need to adjust the designs for different markets. So it, you know, it provides a kind of information flow where the translations are less than perfect. It is machine translation after all. But it facilitates and speeds up this communication to a point where they, they could not function without it anymore. So it's unlike some localization scenarios, scenarios where you have, you know, machine translation, you know, shave a few cents per word off. Here, you, it, it is kind of, it has become mission critical. It, the, the ROI is significantly higher. Um, and, and again, we're, we're happy to talk to you in more detail, and I think that's as much as I'm going to say right now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kitty. Um, great answer. Um, and um, time to wrap up the webinar today. So thank you both, uh, Quinn and Kitty, for presenting today. Um, and thank you all for attending our webinar. Uh, we hope you found today's session useful and informative, and we'll certainly share the recording with you uh, tomorrow, uh, later on in the day. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again on one of our future webinars. So just to say, have a great rest of day, and thank you very much for attending.